Coming up in this week's episode of Weaponized. Now, we just had a, some interview clips with Phil Corso uh, on, on Weaponized a couple of weeks ago. And in the background, you can hear John Alexander's voice. He's one of the guys asking questions. Whatever it is, more complex than we can possibly imagine. And one of the issues as I've become more and more with, uh, involved with various phenomena is the these things are all interactive, and one of the problems, I think, in studying uh, UFOs, definitely today, if you're going to go on the hill, is we still stovepipe the information. So, so what you, I mean, what you're saying, what we know about UFOs is that UFOs as, as physical, tangible craft are just one part of a much kind of larger issue. Is that what you're saying we know? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's far, far broader than that. Secrets, cover-ups, and strange phenomena. UFOs and ideas that challenge reality itself. All these mysteries, all this time. Are we ever going to get to the bottom of these? My name is George Knapp. I dig into news stories that others can't or won't. I'm Jeremy Corbell, and for some reason, people tell me things they probably shouldn't. And this is Weaponized. Weaponized. This is weaponized. We're obviously in a different location here. What what brothel did you bring me to there? Look, Jeremy? man, this is more like the movie The Shining. It's a really cool hotel at an undisclosed location. We're going to talk to Colonel John Alexander today. And if people don't know uh, that name, well, they should, because he's been around the UFO field, the UFO topic for a long time, and related mysteries as well. I've known him since 1996. He was involved uh, with the creation of NIDS, the National Institute for Discovery Science, Robert Bigelow's organization, which included uh, on its science advisory board, Jacques Vallée, Hal Putoff, Kit Green, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, a lot of really impressive people. Uh, that organization was created to dig into the UFO mystery and also the afterlife. Uh, does human consciousness go on after death? So John has been a world traveler. He's gone all over the world in search of these mysteries, uh, more travel than any person I know. Uh, but long before he was involved with NIDS, while he was still a lieutenant colonel with Army Intelligence, he was pursuing UFOs from the inside. He put together this little informal group. ATP was its initials, almost a pre-ATEP, ATEP, um, to try to figure out, does somebody have crash retrievals? Are there stovepipes? He pursued it, uh, didn't find what he was looking for, but stayed on the mystery. Since then, uh, he, he went on to uh, work with the remote viewing program, the U.S. Army, which had developed a program that uh, that grew out of the CIA's research. He w became the director of non-lethal weapons for Los Alamos Lab. Uh, so he's done a lot of stuff and has added fingers in these pies. And I can tell you from traveling with them a little bit and going to UFO conferences, it's like you walk in with Darth Vader. Uh, there's a, people look at John Alexander as this man in black kind of character. He's an evil doer who has helped keep these secrets, which, and he gets the biggest kick out of that. I think he, he likes to exploit it a little bit. You've met him. Yeah, and you know that's not true about him, but so this is my experience. You know, I start looking into UFOs. I'm filming with John Lear telling me all this crazy stuff. And I go over to John B. Alexander's house early days and I, I go to film with him. And first of all, I was astonished how, how kind he was and his wife. And they let me in. I thought he was Darth Vader too. I mean, this was, he was like a spook, right? Like a man in black. Like here's a guy, they based a movie, The, uh, the Men That Stare at Goats, uh, you know, where the CIA is exploring all this consciousness stuff. So I had all these preconceived notions. He's really well-traveled. He's done some incredible work in this space. And he actually hunted for the UFO reverse engineering programs back in the day. And he was sure there weren't any because everybody told him there weren't any. But now I don't know if he is so sure. Yeah, I think maybe the, the goalpost has moved a little bit. Uh, one of the things that uh, that he did back in the days when I first knew him was look into Phil Corso. Now, we just had a, some interview clips with Phil Corso uh, on, on Weaponized a couple of weeks ago. And in the background, you can hear John Alexander's voice. He's one of the guys asking questions, along with Jacques Vallée and Hal Putoff and me and Robert, Robert Bigelow. Bigelow. Yeah. And uh, so John saw that episode and reached out to us. I thought, well, let's get him on to tell us what he did to verify parts of Corso's background, which John was the guy on the ground, doing the boots on the ground investigation. Did Corso work where he said he worked? 
and then investigating further claims. So he called me up and I thought, wow, he'd be great to have one on the program. Yeah, and so you got this army colonel who absolutely was involved with CIA work. He's in like every photograph from back in the day, just lurking in the shadows. I think that's where people get that idea. But this is a guy, how I know him, it's a guy that really wants to know the truth about UFOs and he hunted for it on his own. I think he's encouraged by what he's heard about Grush and Grush's claims and people that he really respects in the scientific field, like Hal Putoff, Jacques Vallée, people have vouched for Grush behind the scenes. So this idea that John B. Alexander, an army colonel, went to try to find this out, I mean, I really admire that. How many decades is this later that he was working with SRI, Stanford Research Institute, uh, working with Bigelow and a team of people to try to find out what's up with this MJ-12 stuff even, right? Yeah, he also was with Robert Bigelow when Bigelow first traveled to Skinwalker Ranch and bought the property. Mm -hmm. Met with the, the ranch family there, heard their stories and decided on the spot to buy the property. And then that started off a multi-year investigation of the ranch that uh, the world didn't know anything about it until many years later. And I know John has said this before, so we I can say it is that, you know, after all these years of looking for you know, the evidence of UFOs, he actually saw one for himself. And I think that that's a pivotal moment. It's kind of like, for me, it's like, you can study and look for something for, but when you have your own experience, which it sounds like he has had. So I'm excited to talk with John B. Alexander. And for those of you who are kind of new to the UFO thing, you started maybe in 2017, and this is a new thing for you. Uh, this is a guy you should know, because it's a guy that has been on this hunt for decades and somebody who was in the military, in intelligence, and his opinion matters in this sense. Yeah, I thought maybe we could talk to him about current events, what happened in Congress with the NDAA. I know he's been following that. He went to the Saul Conference, uh, at, uh, organized by Gary Nolan, and interacted with a lot of the key players there. So there, we have plenty to talk to him about. Let's get him up. Okay, let's grab him. The following is an exclusive interview with retired United States Army Colonel John B. Alexander. We'll start this way. Uh, I don't know how closely you're following the debate in D.C. on Capitol Hill. At the time we're recording this uh, conversation with you, we just got the word that the NDAA had been significantly changed from what UFO disclosure advocates were hoping for. What do you think about that whole process and the end result? Well, uh, first of all, we shouldn't be surprised because we knew when they went to uh, conference uh, between the House and the Senate variations uh, that would be significantly different. Um, unlike what many of you and the, your viewers who are kind of UFO en enthusiasts and think this is critically important, they converse on a broader scale, this is not a voting issue. So from a pure political standpoint, this is something that could be traded away quite easily without uh, any political repercussions you know, for the individual. Now, what does that mean for the disclosure stuff? Yeah, a lot of the critical issues got uh, taken out. And that's uh, kind of unfortunate. Now, we can talk about uh, Carl Nell if you want. As you know, I sat next to him at uh, the uh, Seoul conference, and uh, he gave a very interesting presentation on what was written into what's known as the uh, Schumer Amendment. Unfortunately, the critical issues like you know, eminent domain and you must turn over or bad things will happen to you, uh, pretty much got eviscerated. You know, I'm, I'm trying to take a broader view of the whole thing. I mean, it, as someone who has chased this topic as you have for decades, just the fact that you had legislation that got this far, where the majority leader of the U.S. Senate is on the floor excoriating uh, House leaders who are blocking it, Talking about non-human intelligence and alien technology and the need for disclosure, I mean, it seems to me amazing progress that people, old-timers like you and I, never thought we would see. I mean, uh, am I wrong on this? Yeah. Oh, that's quite right. Uh, we, you know, have been ch chasing this for quite a while, and... Um, 
that you do have Congress stepping up and doing something formally is quite a major uh, an accomplishment in and of itself. Uh, but uh, in you know, a period of whatever compromise, which rarely occurs on the Hill. Uh, again, this is just one of those things that could be easily traded away uh, without the political ramifications. Now, the support that we're getting and the number of people who came forward is quite notable. And we saw this in the House hearings as well, the ones where, you know, we saw you two sitting, you know, behind David Grush there. Uh, but uh, those were very significant. Now, where they, whether that will happen again or not, uh, that kind of remains to be seen. I, I suspect, again, political standpoint, they're going to take the temperature of the broader uh, electoral uh, context as opposed to just uh, people who are screaming at them. Maybe, maybe tell us a little bit about Colonel Nell. Our show reaches a much you know more broad audience than just people on Twitter and online talking about UFO stuff. You know, who is he? Why is he important? What were your impressions of him when you guys were at that conference together? Well, uh, uh, frankly, I will let Carl speak for himself. I don't want to speak for him or anything. Uh, he had a formal presentation at the uh, Saul conference. It just so happened that we literally sat side by side for uh, two days and had a lot of off-camera uh, interviews. I found him a bit more conservative than uh, what you're seeing in Twitterville, uh, people extrapolating from what he said to what he actually said. Interestingly, uh, we had some common background that had to do with Africa. Uh, one of his active duty assignments was in uh, Africa Command, and I had had some experience uh, lecturing there in Dubai and uh, Abu Dhabi and, uh, you know, talking about Africa itself was, was interesting. So he has much broader context than, you know, just this topic. Uh, but, uh, you yeah, uh, know, what he did do in exquisite detail is lay out what was in the uh, Schumer Amendment and People were hoping that, you know, the critical issues of, uh, you know, mandatory disclosure were going to remain. And those, as we said, uh, apparently uh, dissipated now. A lot of people were talking that he talked about catastrophic disclosure. Did he bring that up with you, what he meant by that? Uh Again, I wouldn't want to extrapolate there. There are people who are concerned. I mean, they look at the whole psychological issues. And these are ones that I do not uh, agree with. Uh, George, I think, is aware that my wife did the religious survey for Robert Bigelow, and this was before NIT. And, you know, before that, the conventional wisdom was, oh, my God, if uh, this is revealed, you know, Religion will end, civilization will be disastrous. And of course, the findings were uh, quite the uh, opposite. But there are certain concerns that are raised uh, that, uh, you know, if we suddenly said, Jay, there's a non human intelligence that may or may not be in contact with various elements on, on Earth, that it would be potentially uh, disruptive uh, to the uh, psychology and sociology of the civilization. Uh, my uh, presentations have always said, <clears throat> you know, that uh, confirmation of what you already believe, we must remember that most people actually already believe in uh, UFOs, but confirmation of what you believe is not uh, going to be catastrophic. John, uh, it seems like By the, the, way, the, the so question the, there is a question that I ask here, and it's kind of facetiously, and it is what's for dinner? And by that, I mean that for the people who are being addressed here, they're much more concerned about the day to day things that are ongoing in their life at this time than any external threat uh, might uh, involve. Uh, and unfortunately, this extends very, very broadly. But it's, um, and I think, 
an issue that is not taken seriously enough by the UFO community who believe that this is the, the ultimate issue that will you know, change everything and change belief systems. Uh, the question is, do you have to go to work or do you have to go to school the next day? The answer is yes. The same is true for Congress, right? I mean, there's always something more important for Congress to deal with than UFO disclosure. There's budget issues. There's impeaching the president. There's election security. And, you know, there is some support now for some sort of UFO disclosure among key players in Congress. But there's always something else that takes precedence over that. Uh, when you compare this to uh, what's going on in uh, the Middle East in particular at, at the moment, or in Ukraine and the balance with the Soviet, or Soviet Union, that dates me, obviously, uh, with the issues with Russia, potential threats to uh, NATO, and you throw on top of that all of the economic issues, health issues going on in the U.S., yeah, there, there's a lot of things that are biting them a lot harder than UFOs. Yeah, back to the Saul conference, the fact that people of your caliber, Nell, Gary Nolan, Jean Valet, were there discussing this in open, it feels like the ball has been moved down the, the field, that the playing field has changed in that the open discussion among people of that caliber about non-human technology being stashed here or there and then the same things being debated on the floor of Congress, the House and the Senate, people asking, where is this stuff stashed? Feels like a sea change. Um, you've been at this a long time. Does it feel that way to you? Oh, absolutely. I think there's two big issues. Uh, one is the Saul Foundation itself, that it exists with uh, Gary Nolan. Now, he's this is... Gary Nolan at Stanford unit in the Nolan Laboratory. So that tells you some place where he is on the food chain, very, very high up. And a very well-funded uh, foundation willing to come forward and all, have the institution allow them to uh, participate. Uh, another of the speakers there, of course, was uh, Avi Loeb. And uh, given his procedures position at uh, Harvard with the Galileo project and being associated. I might mention, I'm sure George, you remember many years ago, uh, there was a conference at MIT with John Mack and uh, uh, Fitcher. And it was interesting when we attended that in the early 90s, we had to sign a statement that said, we understand that we are, you know, at uh, MIT, not by MRT, MIT. They did not want the institutional logo associated with it. So this is, in fact, a huge change uh, in that perspective. That Stanford was hosting, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, is there any else, anything else that came out of the Saul event that uh, that the public maybe hasn't talked about? You know what? It was interesting to me that the the caliber of the presentations was, you know, it's world class folks. But the gathering of the audience members, I, I would think that that was where a lot of the really fun conversations took place that we and the public never get to hear. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. It was interesting. Um, I was uh, standing in line. They they were funded well enough that they actually provided lunch for everybody. And we went out there and there were, I, I was surprised, but two to 300 folks. So I'm standing in line and the guy just thought, you know, why are you here kinds of things. And he says, oh, I just retired from the skunk works. And so we had an interesting conversation, and I was asking, as you know, I had, uh, knew Ben Rich, and I was looking for some people that he was, and did a name check, and they came back to me. And unfortunately, the individual I was looking for has a transition. But uh, yeah, it was very interesting, very broad. Uh, as you know, Whitley was there uh, as an audience member, but uh, interjecting periodically, and Jacques periodically would get up and address uh, issues uh, about the, um, you know, the, the the lectures that were going on. So there's a lot of informal stuff 
I noticed that you did a, a, a presentation the other day where the guy uh, said he got out of his car and somebody had recognized him. I had identically the same thing. I literally parked in the car. I had driven over there, and this guy goes, are you? And I'm like, yeah. And so that was kind of a surprise. And somebody I had never met before and wouldn't know. And, and that was one of the big advantages, even with the speakers. There were a number of folks like Chris Mellon, whom I communicated with many times, but had not physically met uh, before that. And, uh, Diana Pasolka and uh, Avi Loeb, uh, for instance, who was really a great chance to uh, interact both formally and informally. As you said, a lot of this chit chat that was going on uh, in the audience itself. Um, let's talk about crash retrievals, reverse engineering, been a controversial topics for a long time, generally dismissed as UFO nonsense for a long time, including, I think, by you for a while. You had a chance while you were still an intelligence officer with the U.S. Army uh, to go looking for this stuff. There was an ATIP before ATIP, an ATP. Tell us about how that, how that search for you began and how it's evolved over the decades. <laughs> Well, it has, and uh, it ends up with a huge, I don't know. I mean, well, one of the problems when you get into these fields is that the data never always fit, uh, no matter how, how you cut it. Our, uh, I, I, I happened to have been, I guess it was a lieutenant colonel at the time that decided to start it and had talked to some people and the question to me was, have you ever heard of Area 51? And, you know, this was just barely breaking even in the classified uh, circle. And uh, so decided to put together a group uh, and invited people. You had to have TS, SCI level clearances had to have an interest, had to know who you were. It literally was an old boy network in that the participants were all male at the time and got together. Our going in position was that Roswell was real, that they had probably looked at it and said, what the hell? They have no idea what this is, can't figure it out. We'll put it away. We'll come back and revisit it. And even in the literature and folklore today, that is kind of what uh, what you're hearing. Um, <clears throat> what we thought at the time would have been, I guess, F-22s, but now it might be an F-35. If you had an F-35 uh, crash to the Amazon and uh, the Karina Crory pick it up and look at it, you'd probably get better spears, but you wouldn't know anything about stealth or flying or anything like that. So we thought that that was probably the differential. Interestingly, um, all of the people in there knew the background on the rumors, but everybody was pointing fingers and said, oh, I thought you did that. Oh, I thought uh, you did that. Uh, <clears throat> got to very high levels. As you know, I interacted with the director or deputy director of all those three-letter agencies, and the consistent uh, was the same. Uh, so either an awful lot of people lied to me, uh, which is a possibility, I suppose, but it would have had to been really concerted, or they didn't know. And, uh, as you know, we eventually went to um, uh, SDI. We had transitioned, so, well, we want uh, to get money. And I, uh, I've told the story before, but uh, General Abramson was there, and I started off with UFO 101, and I had introduced the entourage, and they had people from all of those agencies with me. And uh, so I asked him about it, and he, he, about 10 minutes in, he actually stopped it and said, wait, 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 who are you guys really? I mean, this was like a deer caught in the headlights, you know, went back around, expressed all the agencies, and we got that. By the time we were finished, and he says, okay, well, you got my attention. There were some intelligence issues I won't go into that were kind of critical that we that he didn't know, but had nothing to do with uh, 
UFOs or anything. But his bottom line was, he says, now, look, we, what we'd like to do is make this more formal, get funding. He had a $5 billion uh, budget at the time, which was the biggest in DOD, uh, which meant everybody was out with their knives, you know, trying to uh, get the money. And he, what he said was, the quote was, I'm interested, but I can't touch this. If I get caught doing this, and he says, no, look, I'm doing some hairy stuff now. But if I get caught doing this, you know, they're going to, you know, crucify my budget. Then he did get kicked uh, for a billion. Uh, so the point was, and much like we hear in the discussion even today about, the, you know, the stigma uh, that attach with it. But in that case, it was a potential threat. Uh, to uh, you know, what he saw it as a potential threat to, to the budget. Now, there is an individual that uh, I know George has met, who was, uh, if you remember, Dean Judd, whom I brought to uh, NIDS and was on the board. Well, Dean, <clears throat> at that juncture, was the technical director, chief scientist for SDI, and he later became the NIO, the National Intelligence Officer for Science and Technology. And I am absolutely sure we talked about this literally up until his death and for hours and hours and hours and certainly was not read into uh, anything uh, like that, which tells me if these programs are you know, what you're hearing is accurate and turns out to be right, and I was wrong, um, it means key people were left out of the circle. It's just about criminal. And some of it, I think, may literally be criminal, uh, if true. So has the goalpost moved for you in a sense that when you were actively looking for it, you couldn't find it? And, and I think for a while you thought maybe it doesn't exist. Now, after Congress digging into it, after whistleblowers coming forward, after Grush testifying, after a Saul conference, has it moved for you? Do you think maybe it is out there and it's stovepiped and it's hard to find? Well, that kind of was almost my, my position. I guess I was more to it can't be true, uh, just based on the number of folks that I had to uh, interact with. And there's other very high level people uh, that we interacted with who said absolutely not. Uh, I might tell one other war story, but I was briefing a very high level science uh, board on space. And uh, it was the same thing came in, uh, that particular one, I, I was alone. Uh, and <clears throat> we're an hour or so, gave UFO 101. And then they went around, they said, without any question, there were a couple of them. And this guy jumps up and slams and just it went high order and saying, you're not supposed to know that, that's what you learn when you die. The point is that individual, well, Walt LaBerge, I'll name him now that he's died, he had been DDRNE, Deputy Director for Research and Engineering for the uh, uh, DOD. At the time that, I, that this occurred, he was a senior vice president for Lockheed, and I know you've addressed that you think Lockheed was one of those involved. I've got to tell you this, what surprised me is that he would lose, and he definitely lost his composure, but that that would happen in a scientific meeting among his peers was really telling to me. But we hit an emotional nerve, and it wasn't because they were hiding something. It was like, this is just not a topic. So that's just one of the many examples that basically, but having said that, as you know, you and others that we, some we both know, um, have all come up and said, believe Grush. And uh, if true, that's going to be literally a game changer. Uh, like I said, I don't think it's going to change, swing public opinion or be, as you said, a, a catastrophic issue for them. But from a uh, scientific perspective, uh, I think it's going to, it's where the most of the uh, uh, 
emphasis is going to change dramatically. Let me ask about Corso. Yeah, I do want to ask about uh, Corso, but I, I also just want to say, I think the, the catastrophic disclosure kind of meme that's going around is just the idea that if we don't have in place a systematic way to slowly uh, incorporate this information that we've been reverse engineering these, that, that you know we have samples of these craft, that was the implication that if we don't have a disclosure process set forward that is uh, coherent, that there could be this issue with um, maybe a leak or, or people breaking from the fold, that it would be more catastrophic, you know, the way stuff is disclosed about this. I, I disagree with that, but I think that's what people are kind of talking about when they mention that. Do, do you think, before I ask you about... Yeah, no, my basic issue on this is I have some problem with threat assessment. In my book, in fairness, I said there's two issues. One's, you know, that for from an international, you know, threat perspective, and the other is civil aviation because of implications in both cases. I'm moving a little away from that, but you have to remember when we say the Department of Defense relies on threats. So if you want to have funding in DOD, you've got to be responding to something that's necessarily a threat. And as we said, that, um, you know, the Condon report, Condon was right, because the question to Condon was not, are there UFOs? Is this a threat? We certainly haven't seen an invasion or anything of that nature that has uh, taken place in 70 years uh, intervening. Um, so I, I think that, uh, well, my assessment now in looking at, I've always said, you know, but I, well, as George knows, we, we've talked about this in some detail, terribly, terribly complex. And as I liken it much unto uh, cancer, if you will. And the reason I say that is that the government has a role to play in cancer research, but it's not the role. And in my view, this is, I think everybody agrees, this is a global uh, phenomenon that incorporates everybody. And DOD would have a role to uh, play in this, but not necessarily the role, because I think it's far broader. And I don't think governments in all can respond very well to something as generic and all-encompassing as this uh, might be. I mean, they like to focus on very narrow sorts of things where you can have an ROI, return on investment, know exactly what you're doing, and uh, establish uh, steps uh, in the way. So we're having what I call techno hell. It's not the men in black. It's not the CIA. It's a bad internet connection. So John Alexander has dropped off the planet and radar, but um, I think we're going to grab a little bit more with him in another session. Uh, so we're going to do it that way. Due to technical difficulties, the interview was continued on a different format. So we're back. We had techno problems. I'm going to blame that on the man in black himself, John B. Alexander. You must be monitored, John, but here we are back and we have good audio and visual. So I want to pick up where we left off. We, we had just kind of started about some of the work you had done and about your attending the Soul Foundation, talking about Carl Nell and national security. And I had a burning question, and you were about to answer it before our last recording. My, my argument to you is that there are national security issues with UFOs, even if they say they pose no national security threat, which has been the line that has been towed for a long time to not have to study UFOs. You've written a whole book. George is going to talk about that. But what I wanted to ask you is, isn't it a national security threat if we are not openly studying this with our brightest minds, crafts, actual UFOs, which we know we are, isn't that a national security threat that another nation could leapfrog us, could get to the point where they are past us with these technological innovations? And also, isn't it a national security threat, the secrecy itself to keep the American public in the dark about the, the nature of the UFO phenomenon? What do you have to say about that? Uh, quite a lot. Actually, 35 years ago, when we were doing the briefings on the advanced theoretical physics issue, 
and to try to convince people we should be doing it. One of the issues was uh, a leapfrog by the Soviet Union, uh, China wasn't the key issue at that point, uh, would have been unacceptable. So that was certainly a concern. And we do know that the Soviets were actively involved, you know, for decades. And we know that, George, I mean, this is something that David Grush has talked about, that he was exposed to documents from a foreign nation. He said this on News Nation a bunch. He was exposed to the, the fact that another country knew about our reverse engineering of UFOs programs. It's not a huge leap. And I can tell you for sure what he's referencing is what you brought back from Russia, what you smuggled back. That's what he was exposed to in the classified realm. So you know very well that this is an issue, right? The Russians made it very clear. The head of their UFO program, Colonel Sokolov, that we uh, interviewed, met, spent a lot of time with, said that there is no doubt about why they were studying UFOs. They wanted to develop the technology. They wanted to figure out how they could do what they do and and be, build their own so that they would, quote, kick our butts in terms of stealth technology. They were reverse engineering or at least attempting to understand how to engineer flying saucers back in the late 80s and into the 90s. So we can can make guesses uh, about what the Russians are doing now, how far they've progressed. Uh, I know that Harry Reid in multiple conversations, private and public, that I've had with him over the years, thought that the Chinese were doing the same. He thought maybe the Israelis had a program at one point. So the other nations are trying to get it. There is a race to figure this stuff out. I don't know if we'll ever crack the technolo technology of how these things work or build our own, but we are trying. John, you had written about, um, I, I think you, you've made statements that you've been pretty skeptical about the idea of crash saucers and, you know, Roswell goodies being stashed in a hangar over the years. Now that you've heard David Grush, you've interacted with your colleagues at Saul, your friends, Hal Putoff, Eric Davis, people who know a heck of a lot about this and have made very strong statements about crash recoveries, reverse engineering. Have you changed your opinion? Are you more open to the possibility that this is real? Well, I've certainly had to rethink that. Uh, one of the problems that, that I personally have is I go with my firsthand data. All of the things you've related are secondhand. And my firsthand data, and we can go into some of those people, um, said, no, uh, not there. Uh, but having said that, uh, and in recent months, I've talked to friends who are very, very highly placed. Uh, well, I think Hal's uh, one of those to say, believe Grush. And uh, I think, as you know, the issue is that the pieces never always fit what, what you've done. I don't care where you enter this process. You take it, there's always conflicting data. And as many people are saying, particularly with what David Grush has said, is, okay, uh, everybody says, I have a friend of a friend who, you know, directly participated, what has not come out yet, and, uh, you know, it is the, and I'm the one who did it, and here it is. Uh, having said that, there is one I'd like to throw in. I think I mentioned before that uh, we eventually got to SDI in Star Wars, and it seemed clear that they, at least the people I dealt with, which included the director, did not have direct knowledge. And one guy that I'll throw out is uh, Dean Judd. Um, I'm pretty sure that George has met. And uh, Dean was the technical director for SDI, he was later the NIO, or the National Intelligence Officer for Science and Technology. This is the guy, NIOs are at the, at the tippy top. This is where all of the things get integrated, because you can't go to the president and say, well, CIA thinks this, but DIA thinks something else. So you have to have, it used to be the IC started Intelligence Community Staff, which was before DNLI, well, that's where Dean said uh, that. <clears throat> Dean was a close personal friend, and I talked to him literally up until two days before he died, 
And uh, we talked about this directly for hours and hours and hours, and he definitely did not. Well, that tells you that if Grush and these others are correct, that this is a serious issue, and people who needed to know did not. Well, just from a common sense angle, if you it is so compartmentalized that somebody like Judd does not know, then the the circle is very small. How do you make progress on something that is seemingly as difficult as this to figure out when very few people allow them to see it? Yeah, well, there's two issues. One there has you know, from science and technology and he knew space architectures inside out. I mean he was, you know, at the absolute top of, of the pyramid. And if somebody's going to have to go and brief the president and say, this is what, you know, we have, we, the entire intelligence community, and are not familiar with it, that's a critical shortfall. It's a almost tantamount to treason. And so what you're saying, George, is evidently correct to a very small circle. And, that, you know, I've used the analogy of cancer. Uh, and it has several applicabilities, but the point here is absolutely essential that we get in with the best and brightest on one of the key issues there is making it permissible for them to be involved without risking their reputation and their livelihood. And people have had problems with that uh, in the past. Uh, so terribly complex and we have uh, a terrible shortfall because if you're going to address something as complex as this, the model I suggest now is the Human Genome Project. And what we did, there you had a project that was terribly complex, well, understanding the entire genome. And the approach was to bring in multiple countries, universities across the board, and most importantly, sharing the data, and that's what is not happening in this area. Back to the Grush thing uh, for a moment. The idea that what has been shared so far is hearsay, I'm not sure that's right anymore. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's wrong because he has testified under oath behind closed doors. Others have done so as well. People that Jeremy and I have spoken to directly have told members of Congress, this stuff is real. I worked on it. And I saw it, and here's where it is. That information was shared with Arrow. That information was shared with the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community. And members of Congress have even said, we've heard this stuff. We better hope it's not the Chinese or the Russians. We have to hope it's aliens. But, you know, I think we're way beyond the hearsay point. It's just the fact that we, the public, haven't got to see any of this stuff and haven't had any of that closed-door testimony confirmed on the record. Yeah, but what I'm addressing is something that's far broader than that, and that is getting us into the information into the hands of academia and scientists uh, across the country, because that has not happened. What you're saying is there's a relatively still a small circle of knowledgeability. Uh, this is your your book, one of your books, John. UFOs, Myths, Conspiracies, and Realities. I won't ask you to, you wrote this a while ago, but I want to ask you to quote it chapter and verse, but you have a section called The Devastating Psychological Impact of Secrecy. What do you mean by that? And um, it would seem like we're already in that conundrum, are we not? Well, of course, that's broader. Almost everybody you know, that is involved with the intelligence community knows that uh, over-secrecy is a, a terrible cost. Both in intelligence, now 9-11 certainly brought that out, where we saw that agencies were not sharing critical data on Islam terrorism. So this is a euphemism across the board. Probably shouldn't buy in the air or bang the Air Force, but I found they would have classified the words electromagnetic if they could. I mean, I dealt with them both in the Cerberus and later in Los Alamos. And, and the tendency of the people wanting to you know, cloister the information, and my argument has been physics and chemistry and those work the same for everybody. Uh, and when you're adjusting complex problems, you've got to be able to share data and bring more in. And from a threat perspective, if you have something you deal with as a threat, you've got to be able to warn them. And we're still seeing that as uh, certainly not a 
precipitating to us the world, you know, and, and people who need it. And that's common today in uh, say counterterrorism threats. You know, what's happening literally as we speak <laughs> because of the threat. You know, and, you know, when they go off into the political anti-Semitism issue, but there are threats here in the U.S. And how do you share that data and compare that with the complexity? Uh, now I want to tell you something where you know you may or not even believe in the possibility. And so uh, it's uh, terribly detrimental. I also believe that this is detrimental in the political uh, arena as well, is that uh, the believability of the government, when you get caught, you know, sequestering information that basically everybody knows, or at least knows parts of it, uh, just makes you look pretty bad. Jeremy? Yeah, you... You, you've written a couple of books on this, and so I, I really want to nail this home on what your opinion is. So overclassification and secrecy. If, if UFOs are as real as they're telling us they are, and this is happening, and we've actually been reverse engineering them, what is that danger of that secrecy to the American public? Like, Why are we fighting for transparency on this issue to understand it? What is the really like the, the pointed... Uh, instance where you can tell us that this secrecy is actually dangerous well that's that's far more broad than uh, i think what you're bringing out because there are specific issues you know, the public agenda as we know believes in ufos and many of them have it and daily now uh commercial sensor systems pick up things and they're they're reported so the question of is it out there or not the, what you're really raising is a question of What's the level of government knowledge, ability, and the interest as to where they go? You can uh, argue that. I argue on the broader scale, the, what's detrimental is the uh, lack of trust in the government itself. Now, that, I, I think, we're seeing is a, more of an existential threat uh, than even uh, some kind of crafts coming in. I think we will. you'll see that... Uh, the idea of, uh, you know, we're going to oppose an ET threat or something just does not matter. Uh, I used the example of uh, Desert Storm. Uh, and when we attacked uh, Iraq, uh, one of the things that happened was that the first thing they did was take down the radar systems. And the systems they have were in Soviet and pretty damn good. Probably, uh, you know, and our leap on that was about 10 years. We were able to bring that system down in about 30 minutes where you had air superiority and then air supremacy. My point there is, if you're talking a 10-year gap in knowledge ability, you know, can you imagine what it would be if you were trying to oppose a, a threat that's a 1,000 years or something like that in advance? It, uh, we're, you're just not going to match that kind of threat in, in any way. Right. Like if we've had the, the basic idea of nothing to see here, move on. What I noticed in the past was it was, well, UFOs pose no national security threat. That was a way for our government to say, move on. We don't, we are not responsible for this information, but we are now seeing even with flight safety, the number of pilots that have come to me and George provided us footage, provided us testimony. I mean, just within the last couple of weeks of unidentifieds coming into either close proximity to their aircraft or even just something that they're looking at in a distance, this itself is dangerous in that if there's no communication about what's going on, you've got people distracted from their jobs. Oh, absolutely. And the book that uh, George showed up one of the day, I mentioned two things at the end. One was national security, the other was aviation safety. So we've known that for a long time. You also found out that, you know, it is not career enhancing for, you know, pilots to come forward. I think the classic example was the JAL flight uh, uh, many years ago over Alaska where the UFO was seen, you know, it went on, what, 90 minutes or so, and you had multiple radars, different systems picking it up, and he lands in Mad Mitchell. 
in response to coming forward and talking about it, JAL fired the pilot for embarrassing the company. So, you know, if you have that kind of a mentality, uh, it's going to be very difficult. And so a lot of pilots, and I've heard the, probably the recordings that you have where they say, you know, I'm seeing something that said, you want to report a UFO? No, 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 forget that. Uh, you know, you just don't, do not want to go all the record. This is why I get back to the issue of bringing in the best and brightest and to make it you know, permissible for them and all of these uh, observers to report it without risking their reputation or livelihood. This is something that George and I deal with and, you know, the last couple of weeks a lot personally is that you get these commercial airline pilots and they're, they are just showing, they're filming out the cockpits, they're seeing what's going on. They, they don't have a process or a way to really relay that information without that stigma, without having those reprisals of being that person that does that. So they're coming to us and, and they're concerned. They're concerned about, you know, their livelihoods, about filming out a cockpit. The, the thing is, is that it's my understanding that if there are safety concerns and they're not being handled in the proper way, then there's nothing that should restrict air crew from, from sharing that information because it has to do with safety. So, yeah, I guess there's an increased frequency, at least of people seeing unidentifieds. Maybe there, do you think there's more in the sky or do you think our technological ability to capture them are just getting better? And I think it's more the latter. Uh, let me, I'll tell you a story. Uh, George is familiar with NIDS, the National Institute for Discovery Science. And um, uh, when but this goes back in the yeah, early 90s now, well, we went to the FAA. And I happened to have known the deputy director of security uh, for the FAA. Uh, by the way, they had been talking, this gets to 9-11, they had been talking about, you know, potential for terrorism quite a while. Um, and for their efforts, they got told that, you know, airlines just pat them on the ass and, and have people, make, you know, have a happy trip. Uh, so they got fired for that. But I went to him and said, we would like to, uh, you know, become the repository uh, for the information, the central point of contact, which did eventually happen. Interestingly, when we had the meeting back in the FAA headquarters, I think Bob would call them when I were there. <clears throat> Some of the senior execs uh, were a little bit questioning, as was my friend who had set up the meeting. But when you talk to people who would come up through the ranks of FAA, you know, the guys was, you know, getting the radars, um, they really didn't have any problem. I mean, they knew this stuff was going on. There was just no way to a central repository for information or a reporting channel, which is absolutely critical and really does need to happen because of the issues you mentioned. Yeah, and I'll remind you guys, I know you're very aware of it, but our audience might not. I got to spend a lot of time in Washington, D.C., with a man named John Callahan, who was second in command of the FAA, from what I recall. And he testified in a mock congressional hearing that we held in 2013. It was called the Citizen Hearing on Disclosure. You can see all of that online. But I love John Callahan's testimony because here he is back in the day, high rank in, in the FAA. And they recorded for the first time ever this huge amount of data on a UFO. And so he was excited. He got it. He brought all those tapes in. He reviewed it. They were joined by the CIA and he testified in, in front of these congressional members and a senator. He says the CIA came in and they said, you didn't see anything. You're not allowed to talk about it. That's the end. And, and he testified about this. Nothing to see here. Move on. So that attitude of just dismissal even when there are these flight safety concerns. Uh, we heard from John Callahan before he died telling us this story. I, th I think we should play that little segment because that really kind of puts a pin in it for me. Declassified videos, authentic Department of Defense footage. Oh, what was what? Oh my God. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the SA. They had a uh, UFO chase of 747 across the Alaskan skies for some 31 minutes, flying in controlled airspace without the FAA's approval. NORAD called. They lost the target. This is the first time they ever had more than a moment 
of radar data to look at. The CIA guy standing next to me says, this event never happened. We were never here. We're confiscating all this data and you're all sworn to secrecy. The UFOs don't have transponders and they don't care about our rules and regulations. They come and go. I don't know how you're gonna solve that problem. Well, Sir Joe, I, I believe that the point of that was the JAL flight that I was talking about because it did have radar uh, on that one. So that's a Japan Airlines flight. So if people don't know about it, it's a very famous case. And that's why we brought him to D.C. to do this testimony was because he had direct knowledge. He actually had uh, in his briefcase the actual tapes and we had good talks about it. But that was the Japan Airlines flight where a pilot so I think it was a couple of different rectangular shaped objects with pattern lights that were, you know, kind of, there were huge, maybe it was shaped differently, but the lights I think were in a rectangle. That's what you guys were talking about. John. Well, it's more important, I think, is you had the ground radar that was tracking it. And then they said there are other systems, which was probably Cobra Dane, uh, which was in the black world. This was something that was looking into the Soviet Union. Uh, but was close enough. So you had, this is one, again, multiple radars beside the FAA radars. You had the defense radars picking up and confirming the incident really happened. John, um, we all saw what, what, what happened over the past couple of weeks in Congress. You had strong support for UFO disclosure legislation. Chuck Schumer and Mike Rounds, Marco Rubio, Kirsten Gillibrand, in the Senate, bipartisan. Same thing in the House. But the legislation got gutted at the last minute. This is the National Defense Authorization Act. It's mm -hmm. the biggie. And they have to they pass it every year. This year, our country is so politically divided. There are so many different issues that have been attached to that thing that, that it actually was threatening whether we'd be able to pass it or not, which allowed a couple of key congressmen, uh, House chairmen, uh, to scuttle the UFO legislation say, look, the NDAA is not going to be approved if this stuff is in there, and they gutted it. Um, I, I would remind people who are listening to this that you and NIDS had some experience with this on the very same issues. You went to Congress in the 90s uh, with the issues of national security and air safety, and you had basically approval for a congressional hearing way back then, and it got scuttled too, didn't it? Well, we didn't quite have approval. Uh, we did have a congressman who was in there in space who wanted to move forward. Uh, at that time, Sensenbrenner, uh, head of the uh, science and technology, he was very negative. And what we were going to do was had decided to wait him out because uh, he was moving out and did eventually take on uh, a judiciary committee. But the, the issue uh, is there, again, is you have you know, so strong support. Well, then you've also got some negative people. We can talk about that as a lot because you get actually into some religious issues uh, as well when you, uh, you know, touch on these things. Um, so we were close. Uh, some other things I won't uh, blame. Some other people came to town screaming and shouting, and, you know, Congress does not like that and put them at risk. The key issue on all of these, uh, particularly with the NDA right now, this is not a voting issue. UFOs are not abortion, okay? People vote on, on the latter. They don't vote on this. So from a political perspective, it is easy to uh, trade off on this because you're not going to lose votes. I don't know if your ears were burning this week, John, but th this issue of what happened to those 90s congressional hearing, the possibilities, was brought up again, and so was your name. People were brought up the Dr. Death nickname of yours, which I know you you get a kick out of. They say Dr. Death killed this. And he came in and forced his way into these meetings. Uh, Stephen Greer was briefing Congress, and you scuttled the whole thing, which, as I remember, that's not exactly how it went down. It's definitely not how it went down at all. I did not get involved, and uh, it was his program that came to town that did get it killed. Uh, because it's scared, you know, he's one who raises a lot of all blue and, um, you know, 
Congress does not like that. And again, this is far enough back that this did not have the credibility that has currently happened, as you pointed out, since, particularly since uh, 2017. And everything that has moved forward from there, and you did not have you know, things like the congressional, not just the congressional area, but the DOD coming out and saying, we're having interactions. That was... You know, not mentioned at the time. So, John, I just got a question. So after, you know, look, you have been involved with this for so long. From my perspective, you have been like George, you know, fighting to try to get transparency, understanding and truth. Every room there was where something was going down. It seems like you and George were in there talking with people from Corso to, to, you know, everything along the way. My big question to you is, what do we know? about ufos sure they said ufos are real now but what do you know what do we know for sure about ufos well the first line of the book that george showed up is ufos are real and i meant that in the physical sense they are craft that they interact that the last uh, couple of paragraphs go something like whatever it is more complex than we can possibly imagine and one of the issues is i've become more and more with uh, involved with various phenomena is the, these things are all interactive. And one of the problems, I think, in studying uh, UFOs, definitely today, if you're going to go on the hill, is we still still fight the information of what you're going to allow in. Now, one of the questions is, okay, what's what's included? Do you, are you going to, you know, I start in my briefing, what do you mean by a UFO? And it says, like, I little balls of light. I've got craft miles across and thousands and thousands of variations uh, in between. So what is it that you want to throw? The whole issue of are we going to deal with orbs? Uh, then you get into abduction phenomena and it goes on and on. You know, stuff has been seen, as we know, for millennia. And, uh, you know, it, you have a huge problem just to begin with. How are you going to define what you choose to study and what, what do you mean by the UFO? You can also have a lot of prosaic things that are flying around and we do know that, you know, the misidentification of any number of things is still technically a uh, UFO. And if you look at the uh, thing that uh, Jacques and uh, Eric did when they put out, if you're going to study these things, one of them is that you need to take into account uh, other kinds of anomalous phenomena. So, so what you, I mean, what you're saying, what we know about UFOs is that UFOs as, as physical, tangible craft are just one part of a much kind of larger issue. Is that what you're saying we know? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's far, far broader than that. And I will suggest that consciousness is the key piece of it. Now, there are a lot of people who are willing to deal with little tin cans, you know, in that narrow physical arena. But when you get into the broad issues of consciousness and maybe even the nature of the universe, you mentioned back to Max Planck saying, you know, you cannot get behind consciousness. And then we're in the issue such as the physical universe arises, you know, material from consciousness as opposed to. Consciousness is something that's generated in your mind. Now you're in the areas that are just terribly top like Well, what I also said at the end of the book, though, was that we're not at the point, in my view, and this is still true, of even knowing where to ask the right questions, let alone come up with simple answers. I don't think there are going to be any. John, uh, Jeremy mentioned Phil Corso. Last a couple of weeks ago, as you know, we had Phil Corso some excerpts uh, on this program and and reintroduced his his claims to the world. Uh, as you'll recall, in 1996, when NIDS was just starting out, I brought the idea to Robert Bigelow and you and some others. Told them about this guy I had known for a couple of years uh, since '92 and this incredible story that he had about being involved in a program at the Pentagon. You and I jumped on a plane. Flew to Austin, picked up Hal Putoff, flew on to Florida, went down and met with Corso. Can you recall uh, what your impressions were of that meeting and the one that followed 
to start with. And then we'll get into the work that you did to try to verify uh, Corso's background and the questions that you raised about him. Well, first of all, Corso is absolutely real. Uh, but there's a lot of things that have been attributed uh, to him that are not qu quite accurate. Now, when we met him, what you correctly mentioned in that uh, program, I did watch it, was how the family understood basically it was his son. And uh, we were sitting out in the uh, RV, as you mentioned, talking, and son would go, no, 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 you can't say that one. So the next day, uh, we went to an uh, airstrip, and the son has a hangar there and was making a plane. So we would take turns where two of us would go off with Phil and talk about things, and the other one would go and admire his aircraft. Uh, that's where the picture came from uh, that you said. Um, you know, love the guy. I, I, it was, I mean, he was your, your grandpa, if you want, and you really like it. Uh, in the book, Again, the I have a whole chapter called the Corso Conundrum because of things that are accurate, and there's a bunch of material that's not. Uh, there is an appendix uh, in the book. When when the book first came out, I wrote Phil Leonard. It was on seven pages, ten pages of the book, ninety six issues. Uh, that I said here's what I think are wrong, and it was little things like it's a Delphi Maryland, not a Delphia Maryland. That no, the Cold War was not a cover for fighting E.T., which is, you know, part of the claim uh, in there. And it goes on uh, now what, uh, in response, in 1998, I believe it's uh, 98, uh, the book had come out. He had seen the letter. Phil had a heart attack. I was back in the area because my son was getting married and lived just south of there, so uh, by now, uh, by the way, we had gone to Port St. Lucie. That was the area where the, we first saw him. Uh, and he's now living a little further north. And we spent the day discussing all of these things with him. And he said, gee, I need to write another book uh, to correct the error. So he admitted that there were a number. Uh, one of the classics, by the way, and George, I think you have a copy. I don't know why do you gave us the uh, Xerox copies of uh, the book that was written. Now, Phil was not computer literate, so this stuff was either typed or literally handwritten. And he was doing a, a second one, and unfortunately, about 10 days later, had a second attack, heart attack that was fatal. And there's a lot of controversy as to what's in and, and what's not. One of the things from a book perspective, the whole first chapter of the book as published is not part of the uh, well, manuscript that, that we were given uh, when it was copied. Also not included were some of the things you mentioned about going out uh, into the desert and uh, encountering E.T., I gave you one of the pieces that just does not make a lick of sense to me. Uh, and it comes to his famous quote. Uh, he said he's talking to uh, and at E.T. Remember, he had pictures. So I don't know if you showed them a lot, but he actually had drawings of what this little guy looked like. And he said they had to turn off the radars so that the, the craft could depart. And you want us to believe that we now have somebody with the capability of going across the universe uh, that, you know, has problems interacting with human radars. Uh, that, that's just a piece. Of, but it did come up with this. He said, what will you give me? And you're correct about the thing, you know, a new world that you can take it. And, but the other thing about Phil, because we knew him for years, uh, and I, you know, I tried to get him a uh, movie deal, and um, uh, he, the consistency over time, all the problems when people, you know, uh, what a tangle web we weave, et cetera, and he was very, very consistent. It was almost like you could stop him at midpoint and come back any time later, push a button, he would pick up the sentence and move on. So the consistency of what he reported was uh, very accurate. The technology, 
and you adjust a piece of that in the first one, absolutely uh, does not hold together. And But I would mention that, and he always claimed, as I recall, the idea was not to start new technologies. It was to, you know, increase. He was supposed to look at uh, where industry was and where they could take advantage of getting, uh, you know, a piece of the craft. Um, the one that I know best uh, has to do with night vision. And, well... <clears throat> If I'm running on too long, let me know. But the, uh, well, the the guy who literally built my vision lab was a personal friend, and he was amenable to these topics because he had come on. I met him through uh, Bert Sutherland, head of Inscon, and had he had come to the spoon bedding uh, psychokinesis uh, sessions we had. The worst one that I ever gave, by the way was in night vision lab itself. I'm let you don't do this on hell at drought. Uh, so he was very open, but the technologies, you know, that he talks about, um, just not there whatsoever. And I went back, I went back to, uh, Lou, uh, after the book came out, he had long retired by that time, but was still in touch and said, what is this? And part of what he told us that is not true, or a different version of it, is in the actual history of the night vision laboratory. Here's where I'm left, John, is that you did the detective work to verify Corso's background. So you come back to Robert Bigelow and to NIDS and tell him he really did work at the places where he said he worked, right? He did. He, he did. That, and that's, uh, that was very interesting. One of the ones... And you mentioned General Trudeau uh, in the, uh, Trudeau was legendary. And in 1980, uh, they decided to do oral history on some of the generals that had been, you know, instrumental in moving the army forward at that time. And Trudeau was one of them. Now it's 1980, they've retired in the early 60s, when Trudeau is interviewed uh, by the Army War College, Corso was sitting in the kitchen. Yeah, they actually brought him in, so he was taught. I talked to the guy who was um, Corso's, I'm sorry, Trudeau's chief of staff, who did know Corso, and this, but this guy goes on and becomes a lieutenant general uh, down the potty. And he says, yeah, they used to get together and they talk. Now, there are other issues that were brought up. Uh, for instance, uh, small uh, nuclear power uh, facilities and things like that. He mentioned Project Horizon. I didn't hear, hear that one come off. But they were actually, a lot of that work was instrumental in putting us on the moon. And I had uh, asked... Uh, this with uh, Edgar Mitchell, and I asked about it, and he was familiar with some of the. But in the 19, late 1950s, 60s, they were actually uh, designing ways to fight from the moon. And all of those sorts of issues were absolutely true. Uh, you mentioned the issue about uh, how he was talking about the uh, day after Rome or something did check his history there. He was there. Uh, I mentioned that he tended to fluff his credentials a bit, but I've actually read the awards that he got, and they were very, very good for captain-level stuff. They were not the kind of awards that would have been going to a major general who would have been instrumental in, uh, you know, reestablishing civility in Rome after World War II. Uh, but was he in these places? Did he do the same? I might mention, uh, I know it comes up, is uh, Foreign Technology Division. FTD did not exist uh, prior to Corso going there. The other conundrum was, because I actually got the uh, phone book from that area, 
the, the leader was not Phil Corso. It was a guy, I think, by the name of Colonel Spangler. And I asked Phil, I said, well, who is this other guy? And he says, well, well, I don't know. He says, but when you check the, the phone book and you know, the organizational chart for it, uh, Corso is listed as a deputy, not the director. Interestingly, I, I actually found a woman, because in this 1990s, who had been there in 19, since 1943 as the Pentagon uh, was being built and actually remembered Corso, you know, from the time frame uh, that uh, he's there. So uh, I might mention that after Corso leaves this FTD branch, which is quite different from the Air Force one, uh, that ceases to exist. So it was a small group uh, that uh, was there that appears for a, a short period of time, and that time follows uh, Trudeau as uh, that's rather look, I'm going to watch my acronym. It was the Deputy Chief of Staff for Research, Development, and Acquisition. That was the position that Trudeau held, and he did bring Corso in, and uh, uh, they did some interesting things, but uh, which you don't find, and we checked the other technologies, by the way, that, uh, that as you said, that as it's kind of a continuum, uh, which you do not see in the R&D perspective, it's what we call a step function, where you know it's tolling along and then suddenly it increases and then uh, you know, dramatically moves forward. I think uh, in the end for me, Corso was close with Trudeau. Um, I find it reasonable that if they had that stuff, the materials, that that office would have had some of it. I think it's possible that that Corso did distribute this to various labs and, and companies and may have assumed that it was instrumental in what they developed later. We can say this for sure. If any of those companies, Bell Lab or whatever, uh, did get some inspiration from some alien technology, they're not going to admit it that their multi-billion dollar business is built on somebody else's idea. But it's possible that Corso did distribute that material and assume that it had something to do with what came later. It may have, and where you were correct is that, uh, and the story he told us is when they gave it to the industry, everybody kind of assumed that what they were getting was Soviet, not E.T., uh, technology, but there was something that we had picked up on a prosaic sense that looked like it was advanced in, with this health. Uh, like I say, as a conundrum, uh, particularly with Phil, and uh, uh, lovely guy and tried to help him, but uh, yeah, the pieces, that's one when the pieces just don't always fit. You know, bring this back around to current events. So we know that defense contractors twisted arms on Capitol Hill regarding this UFO transparency um, dis, uh, amendments that were kicked around, legislation, and uh, that they oppose giving up what they've got. Let's just pick a name out of a hat, Lockheed. Let's say they have some of this recovered technology. They haven't quite figured out how it works yet. Even if you haven't mastered it or reverse engineered it to the point where you could duplicate it, I'm not sure that I, as a company president, would give that stuff up at all if i'd had it for 40 or 50 years if it could tr could potentially change the economy of the world and be worth trillions of dollars would you give it up if you didn't have to i i wouldn't well no i mean what you for point that was interesting just watching the brown to rant on this where if we have the, the technology and it's owned by the public but you give it to private industry and the advances are made they get the profit, not necessarily we, who I think would literally have a rightful claim on it. You know, the other area is that uh, I also think, and hard to prove as to what crime, but that the programs, my guess is, were just totally illegal. And uh, going to be hard to prove with that. Like, how did they get it? Uh, what? Uh, what was done with it, who who owns particularly intellectual rights to things, got to be very complex. But I can understand from an industrial perspective, 
No way in hell you'd want to admit that or give it up. John, what is the path forward? You know, there, there's many you know ways to, to get to the mountaintop here of basic confirmation and bringing this stuff out to be studied by a larger scientific community. Again, we can make nuclear weapons. We don't teach people how to make them, but we can study nuclear physics. So in the same way here, you know, what is the path forward for discovery on, on this topic that we call the phenomenon that includes UFOs? And are you optimistic for the path forward? Well, sort of mixed on laugh, would like to be optimistic and certainly agree with one of your programs that, that the advances have been made. And we talked before, you know, what Gary did, I was at the SALT conference, but the, the idea that Stanford would not only allow it, but be quite supportive of it. You see the same thing at Harvard. Uh, where what R.V. Loeb is doing, and these things are now acceptable. Uh, I think I've mentioned, I actually think that, you know, governments have a very limited role uh, in this area. Uh, if they've sequestered the information, how you get that out is a different story. But from a government perspective, your rule is governance and running things on a day-to-day -day basis, and in helping on advances, you have some people working on what we call basic technology so that we'll move forward. But in general, that belongs in the civilian sector. And I think this is true there, that as we broaden the scope and bring in more uh, academic, industrial uh, institutes, things like the national labs can play a role, but not necessarily the role. So if we're the biggest thing, in my view, is this gaining of acceptance of credibility and acceptability. Again, doing this and of getting to where you can get our best and brightest involved. If you could be UFO God for a day, what edict would you issue on this on this matter? Well, I've, that's assuming, I guess, from a uh, from a governmental perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I would look at it. That I think the information should be released. Uh, now, I do see an issue on classification. That has more to do with our sensor systems, how our data uh, collected. And you don't want to give away the total operational parameters or vulnerabilities of uh, classification. We do know that many of the sightings, you know, we, they're picked up on radar and then it's not there. How is it that it's available? If you could figure that out, that would be something you do not want to default to others. Um, but you, you would start with the basic premise, I think, that says, A is real. Oops, we made a mistake and we probably should not have sequestered this along, particularly the basic understanding of the. Now, <clears throat> you remember, you run the full spectrum in the, the uh, CT world uh, of, you know, what do you have? Then you get to aliens and the implications of, you know, extraterrestrial or not human intelligence, not human life. Now, that gets uh, pretty broad. Um, I, frankly, I think, yeah, the population could handle it, as I've said many times. Confirmation of what you already believe is not a, a paradigm shift. Now, kids can definitely uh, handle it, uh, but we ought to get them the information out. You've got to get the, the baseline established and then you know, everything we can to get best and brightest, uh, you know, integrated approach and sharing of uh, knowledge. Jeremy, I've shared with you stories about being with John, traveling, being at conferences with him. It's... It's so much fun to see people pointing at him and whispering, and well, there he is. It's it's him, uh, the man in black. John gets a kick out of it, too. I think about nicknames, you know, from fiction. You got Dr. Doom and Dr. Strange. Those are both great nicknames. Dr. Death is right up there, and that's what, what people refer to John as. And they allege that he's got this mind-controlled laser beam that he zaps out and, and stuns people's brains. John, don't do that anymore. Please don't do that anymore. No, well, how can you? 
But remember, uh, my doctorate was done under Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who's the one who brought hospice uh, to the U.S., and I was the president of the International Association for Near-Death Studies, uh, so I've done a little work in the area called the thanatology. So uh, that's my yeah, name. That's, we'll take it. Yeah, I think you got a, a way cooler name. At least you guys both do. People, my friends and enemies call me forename or just, you know, idiot. So <laughs> Dr. Death, Dr. Doom, you're doing pretty good. Well, yeah, John, I, I just really appreciate it, man. You've been part of uh, what I've observed, you know, kind of growing up and seeing inside of this world. You, you've you always been somebody who, who people have kind of maybe mislabeled as one of the men in black. You're one of the good guys, man. You've always fought and tried to move this ball forward. And it seems like it's taking you into really, you know, interesting places in your life. Um, I, I guess I just, I, I just wonder the world has changed so much now with this UFO topic. You know, what are you hopeful for? Like, what is it? What is the best version of reality here? We, we seem to be learning more and more every day. People can get kind of down about it or it doesn't fall the way they want, but we've made a lot of progress. Haven't we said since, since you started this? Let me add, add to that question, Jeremy. Um, are you excited? Uh, about the changes that have happened. You know, you think back to the beginning of NIDS, Bigelow and you and Colin Kelleher and Eric Davis and Hal Putoff and Kit and Jacques and all those people who were pushing for the kinds of changes that we're now seeing unfolding. Are, are you excited about it? Well, uh, I'm a little by excited. Uh, I love enough to worry about it. I'm going to still be here when, you know, some of these advances uh, get you know, more publicized. Uh, but the important thing is that advances have been made, and particularly, in, as I said, in the civilian sector where I think this has to go. And again, the issue of credibility uh, cannot be uh, overstated. Uh, if you notice, uh, you know, with Grush and people like that, you know, is what you see is the ad hominem attacks. Uh, I like to tell people, you want to, I'll show you the bruises. Uh, yeah. This has happened, but we're not getting to where this is uh, acceptable, and uh, I think that's absolutely critical. And you know, uh, again, I keep focusing on best and brightest and get them involved. That's what it's going to take. The other issue is I think you're going to find that this expands uh, in the phenomenal logical of work on some areas we can't go into now that I think are related. Uh, that are just mind-boggling and then potentially even bigger than just is it a non-human intelligence. What do we mean by that? Uh, well, it is an exciting time. We've seen a lot of changes since when you and I were y much younger and plugging away at this stuff. And, and um, at least it feels like we're moving forward and the stigma is, re is reduced at least somewhat. For people like Abby Loeb and Gary Nolan and and big brain folks like that to go ahead and be willing to risk their reputations and their careers to to take this seriously, I mean that's that's by itself is a huge step. I think huge. I, I'd like to ask you one at least last question, and then Jeremy, if you want to get back into it, the best evidence in your estimation is the best evidence in the hands of some government agencies, special access programs, contractors in light of the fact that our military is the ones who have the capability of collecting it. They have a global presence, all these sensors and satellites. Uh, you know, Jacques Vallée has said, wherever the best evidence is, it's it's probably in some room somewhere or several rooms, and it's in the hands of government agencies or government contractors. That could be. Um, but, well, going at who, but again, these very senior people if you allow that Grush and these other whistleblowers are, are accurate, I think that's only a, a piece of the puzzle. What we found out is most of the evidence is already in the public domain. And I do remember back uh, when I was still on active duty and seeing the, the documents and the SCI level documents. And then you compare it to what the public already knew. Most of it was there. The pieces that were missing, most of were sources of message. You know, how good are the sensor systems uh, that are picking it up? And I think that's true. Um, 
again, I was talking to Colm uh, a few weeks ago about this. They say, you know, government's uh, sequestering it. There's only a limited amount that they can sequester. And that is these events happen to be, you know, just everyday people all around the world. And now with the ubiquitous, you know, sensor systems uh, picking this up, uh, you can't, uh, the government has a limited capability on what, how, how much they can control. And, uh, you know, the, the, the truth is out there. And I think you, you make a really good point, which is that there is a ubiquitous kind of data collection going on by civilians, by individuals. You were seeing this more and more. We're just getting more and more footage, not just military leaks and that kind of thing. The average person is paying attention. So by diminishing that stigma, it's becoming a data rich environment where it used to be data poor because of the stigma associated with it. And, you know, real stigma, I mean, loss of jobs, people saying you're not wrapped so tight. So I think the takeaway for me from this conversation is you've seen it all along the way with George, and we're reaching a new era or a precipice where it is smart people can talk about what they're seeing when it comes to UFOs. And that's a huge, I mean, we've we've crossed something major there once we've hit that point. I think, I think we have. So I am eternally optimistic, but specifically optimistic because of the data flow that I'm seeing to me and George, the reporting where people want this information to be known without, you know, worrying so much about losing their jobs as like commercial airline pilots or something like that. So a lot of that precedent was set because people like you guys have been fighting all along the way. So, you know, thank you for that. And uh, hopefully we, we get further. Hope so. Ad Astra. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Great talking with you. Thank you. Know. It's so cool to hear John talk about this stuff just because he's been involved for so long he's been that guy who's like you kind of like everywhere they shouldn't be when it comes to the history of ufos you know do you think that he ultimately will see the answers he wants while he's here on earth do you think we're going to make it there for him i'm not sure any of us are going to get the answers we want you know the best we can do is keep trying you yeah know, keep plugging away uh we'll we'll have to put an image up of uh, some of the books that john has written because there are good broad explanations uh, that suggest how all these seemingly different topics fit together, the kinds of things that NIDS and later the Bass organizations have studied. Um, and he's been involved in this stuff for a very long time, and I would encourage people to check out what he's written. For sure, yeah. So checking out John's books is a, a good way to kind of understand his path of trying to hunt the UFO thing. So anyway, very cool, weaponized, in a strange place. Yeah. Good to see you, man. Yeah. Cadence 13 Studios, available now for free on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your shows.